Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at TradeAthletics.com and today we're going to have a discussion on tips for transferring your pull-down velo or your pull-downs to the mound. So let's dive in. So first, who is this video for? Right, this video is not for everybody. This video is specifically for players where pull-downs have become a mechanical anchor for you. Now, if you aren't familiar with the term mechanical anchors, I'm going to go ahead and link a video up here so that you guys can go and check that out. But essentially the idea of mechanical anchors are it's a any sort of drill where you see a significant improvement in velocity or significant improvement in efficiency or in the, uh, the sequencing or the positions that you're able to create. Right? I call this an anchor because it's something where it clicks for the player and they're able to get into some sort of feeling or position that they would never were able to get into anywhere else. Once you capture that, you don't want to lose it. And so it becomes your anchor and it becomes something that from there you're trying to transfer that feeling elsewhere. You're trying to transfer that feeling to the mound. And so athletes will have something click all the time in whatever various drills or movements that they're doing, but not necessarily immediately transfer to the mountain. So when pull downs are your anchor, and again, they aren't always an athlete's anchor, when an athlete sees a significant velocity increase, maybe they jump up 10 miles an hour on their pull downs in a four to eight week period. Maybe they're hitting significantly better positions, uh, sequencing and efficiency that wasn't there on the mound. Then this video is for you guys. I'm thinking of, in particular, one of our athletes right now, who has gone pretty quickly from 96 to almost 105 on pull downs. And as of right now, he's still stuck in kind of the upper 80s, low 90s off the mound when, you know, again, he should be throwing mid upper 90s given those pull down numbers. He's a guy where the idea is to take these, uh, these better positions, take this efficiency, take this improved direction, take all these things that he's exhibiting on pull downs that have clicked in for him and be able to branch that out and transfer that to the mound. Who is this video not for? Well, pull downs are not for everybody. Uh, contrary to popular belief and kind of this, this thought that in the velocity training world, everyone has to just throw a bunch of weighted balls and do running pull downs and magically that'll all transfer. We don't necessarily subscribe to that train of thought. Pull downs are very specific in what they train and which part of the throw that they actually train. We'll talk more about that in a second. But we actually don't prescribe pull downs to everybody because it depends on what their limiting factor is in their mechanics. Pull downs also don't work for everybody. So maybe we think it would be a good idea. We try it, that's our hypothesis. And it just simply doesn't work. They don't gain a ton of velocity. Maybe they get into worse positions or it just doesn't seem to have a very uh, significant impact in either direction. So this video probably isn't for you. You don't need to be trying to transfer your pull downs if your pull downs really never were very good in the first place. So before we get into some of the tips for transferring your pull downs, um, let's just overview the purpose of pull downs. What exactly are pull downs training? In essence, pull downs are giving you a ton of this uh, free linear momentum. It's giving you this run up. Right, this run up is this artificial move that you aren't able to do off the mound when you have to start from a standstill. So the idea of what pull downs are actually training is it's everything from foot strike through the end of the throw is what pull downs work to improve the efficiency of. Everything from the actual leg lift to the linear move off the mound, pull downs really don't do anything to improve that. Pull downs are also helpful with general athleticism, uh, reactivity, so reducing this conscious thought, um, forcing you to just be an athlete and be reactive and uh, just kind of flow through your patterns without thinking too much. Properly timed intensity, so being able to relax and strike, relax and unwind the throw at the proper time, uh, they can really help with that as well. They can really help when it comes to this linear direction uh, and momentum. So for an athlete, uh, for example, the athlete we mentioned before, he strides really cross body off the mound, but pull downs because it gives you this very, very strong uh, linear momentum, this very strong linear run up, he's able to actually stay on direction on a pull down and that's why his velocity in part creeps up so much. So it can improve direction, it can improve the lead leg block by giving you such strong linear momentum. So to not fall forward on your face, you actually have to stay back behind your lead leg and probably position your upper half and block the lead leg effectively. So it really can be useful for a whole host of things, but it's also not always the solution. Uh, again, which we'll get into more in a second. When pull downs do fully transfer, so if an athlete goes and gains five miles an hour on the pull downs, and they're also up three to five miles an hour on the mound, generally why that happens is the mechanical limit that clicked. The mechanical limit that was fixed from pull downs was in the second half of the throw. It was either the lead leg block, or it was the positioning of the upper half at landing, or it was being able to stay closed at landing, or getting the elbow up and on plane from landing into ball release. It was something in the second half of the throw that was fixed by pull downs that they were able to then carry over and transfer on the mound. So some coaches will kind of take this idea of transfer as a given. They'll post videos of athletes that gain 10 miles an hour on pull downs in a month, which is actually pretty standard. That's very easy to do because a lot of athletes have never done pull downs, it's a novel movement. And so their first throw is 81 because they've never done it before. And just getting synced up, they're throwing 91 a month later, just because they've never done the movement before. And so 
judges will post like so and so athlete gains 10 miles an hour. Well, technically that's true, but it's a little deceptive to say they gain 10 miles an hour because what we really care about is mount velocity. Saying they gain 10 miles an hour on pull downs, and we'll see what happens on the mount. Okay, that's fine, but it can be a little deceptive in terms of how pull down velocity gains are sometimes used synonymously with general velocity gains off the mount. But transfer is not a given. It's very, very common that it's either going to partially or not at all transfer. And so that's what we're talking about here. Transferring velo is a common struggle many pitchers have. So if that's your problem, you're not alone. I would say at least 30 to 50% of athletes who gain velo on pull downs initially struggle to transfer it. Some struggle for quite a bit of time to transfer it. And this is because each step in the process is a new motor, pound, new motor pattern or a new challenge to the motor pattern. So if we think about kind of this process uh, that most, co most coaches take, uh, we'll talk more about this in the next slide, but they're basically going from full running pull downs, like 50 foot running pull down, to throwing off the mound. That's basically going from point A to point Z and wondering, you know, skipping everything in the middle and wondering why it didn't transfer. It's actually amazing that that transfers at all in some cases. Every step along the way, so from pull downs to maybe uh, one step curl hops to flat ground to throwing off the mound to throwing off the mound to a catcher to throwing off the mound to a catcher with a hitter, right? All these individual variables are a new challenge to the pattern. It's a new challenge for the brain to figure out. Again, as you're working through this process, just recognizing that transfer is not a given and a pitcher's pull down velocity gains actually tell us very little about their mound velocity situation. You really can't say, this guy gained 10 miles an hour off pull downs. I wonder what he's going to be off the mound. He's going to gain five or 10. You really can't make those types of assumptions. It really is individual and on a case by case basis. So the harsh reality is that ingraining pattern, ingraining patterns does take time in most cases. And this is because if we go back to kind of motor learning 101, how our body adopts new patterns. There's three stages to this motor learning process. In the start of this, this process, it's essentially a very, uh, it's not very automatic. It's a very conscious process. Uh, it's a very internal focus. You can think about the first time you learned uh, to do any, you know, anything. The first time you learned to do a new dance move, right? You're consciously thinking about it. You're thinking about where everything is in space, where your hips are, where your feet are, where your arms are. And then as you get more comfortable with, again, whatever pattern it is, it starts to become more automatic. It starts to become subconscious, what's called stage three autonomous, autonomous learning. Uh, this is the point where it's automatic and you're ultimately trying to get to where you can think about just actually executing a pitch or attacking a hitter in a game and you're not worried about your mechanics. That's where everyone obviously knows we're trying to get to. But the problem is that as you're adding these new patterns, you're not always going to be instantly in stage three. And so it does take time because your body has to learn to flow through these patterns more fluidly. And it is a skill that does take time to actually integrate into your mound, your mound patterns and your mound mechanics. So subtle changes, something as subtle as going from flat ground to the mound, it seems like it would instantly transfer, but in reality, your body is used to landing, let's say you've been throwing flat ground for four weeks, your body is used to landing uh, you know, on flat ground and so your arm is used to being at a certain position when the front foot's down. Now suddenly you go off the mound and you have to land a split second later, you have to land a frame later. So it's super common that pitchers just can't instantly transfer that. The first time they get off the mound they're flying open because now their front foot's landing a little bit later and by that time their shoulders have opened up. So seemingly subtle changes in what you're doing can have a major impact on what happens down the kinetic chain. And so this applies again to pull downs, but it also applies to the transfer of patterns in general uh, in baseball. The first tip is to challenge the pattern incrementally. So again, the most common approach is to go from these full running pull downs to doing a command bullpen off the mound and then wonder why it's not transferring. Well, essentially you're going from point A to point Z like we talked about. You're skipping everything in the middle. You're taking this huge jump and hoping that it transfers. It's actually incredible that it transfers at all in some cases, right? The problem with this picture is that you didn't progress incrementally, of course, but also that you didn't necessarily address any underlying mechanical issues. We'll talk about that more in a second, but uh, if there's some sort of major mechanical limit, right? If the elbow is still, if the arm's still way down here at landing, if your shoulders are completely open at landing, it doesn't matter how many pull downs you do, if that's how you throw off the mound, ultimately your velocity is gonna be significantly limited. You're limiting your velocity ceiling. So a lot of times they just do pull downs, they just ignore mechanics altogether. They just say, I'm gonna throw a bunch of colored balls as hard as I can and cross my fingers and hope that it transfers. And it's because all they did was just put blind faith in this tool or this implement or this, this book or this program and they didn't actually think through it and address their mechanical issues. They, cr they crossed their fingers and they, uh, they banked on this idea of self-organization. To touch on self-organization for a second, it's this idea that the body will position itself or sequence itself or uh, 
properly uh, position itself to accomplish the task. So if you're giving it a task of try to throw as hard as you can, your body will uh, try to figure it out. Your body will figure out how to put itself in the most optimal position to throw as hard as it can. That holds some weight, of course, but what we found is that if a player has all sorts of egregious mechanical issues, timing issues, position issues, they can't segment their hips from their shoulders, their arm is way down to landing, they're flying way open, their lead leg is really soft, right? If they have some really major, uh, like level three mechanical issues, they're, not gonna be, they're only gonna be able to self-organize so far. They might be able to self-organize from point A to point B. They're not gonna self-organize from a 75 mile an hour pull down with all sorts of issues to a 95 mile an hour pull down because the body can only self-organize so far. Sometimes you actually need to take a step back and address the underlying mechanical issues, hunt for the cause, address that in isolation, and then reintegrate it back into the hole. So this idea of self-organization is great in theory, but in reality, the magnitude of that effect is not quite as broad as we would like to believe. It's only gonna get you so far. If you already have the mechanical guardrails in place, you have general good timing. Now you add intensity to that equation. Now self-organization can happen and can kind of smooth out those patterns and get you a certain amount of improvements. But a lot of times a player will already throw 84 and they'll just add intensity. They'll add this layer of intensity and hope they self-organize and they will to a certain extent within their current constrained set of mechanics and they'll, t they'll cap out at 87 because they didn't take a step back and address the underlying issue. Their hip rotation, their hip mobility, their ability, their, the fact that they're flying open, their arm timing, they didn't address the actual underlying limiting factors that would get them to 95. They just addressed intensity, crossed their fingers, they said self-organization a bunch of times, and they capped out, they gained their three miles an hour, and they hit a plateau. As you begin to challenge the pattern incrementally, you want to determine where in this sequence the breakdown's occurring. So one example sequence, again, there's no right answer here, but one example sequence of how to go from point A to point Z, what, what is B, C, D, E, F? Well, one example is maybe you do running pull downs, then maybe you do one step shuffles or one step curl hops, so you reduce the amount of linear momentum. Then maybe you do a no step curl hop. So you do a curl hop with very little, uh, very little forward momentum, just in place. You do a curl hop, try to still transfer that feeling. Then maybe we go uh, one step curl hops off the mound at the slope. Then maybe we do no step curl hops off the mound. Then maybe we do a slide step off the mound or off a of flat ground, take out the leg lift. Now we add the leg lift in on flat ground. Maybe you do something like a step back or a walking wind up, kind of derivatives of your full delivery. Now we get off the mound out of our delivery, but maybe we start throwing into a net. Maybe once we're able to do the pattern there, we add complexity, we add the catcher. We try to throw down the middle, keep it simple. Now we try to locate. Now we add off speed, now we add a stand and hitter. These are all different steps in the sequence. And when you do this, when there's a breakdown, instead of just going from point A to point Z, we can say, okay, A, A was good, B was good, C was good, D was good. Oh, there's a problem at step E. That's where you wanna place the focus. So two examples of this are uh, two of our athletes here. One of our athletes uh, recently drafted in the fifth round, went from mid 80s to mid upper 90s over the course of about a year and a half. And at one point in that process, he was up to 96 off the mound into a net. And he was throwing about 90, 91 to a catcher. And so the question is, well, why is this happening? Well, he was basically stuck at this point in the process from mound delivery net to catcher. And so if we just start, if we just threw to a catcher and skip the mound into a net, we would say, well, he's only throwing 91. But we were able to see that he had this potential in him, that there was just a breakdown occurring in this process, in this chain. And the breakdown was occurring because he had a low elbow, he was throwing uphill, and so he was actually throwing the ball head high into the net. It would have been way over the batter. And so then when he went to throw to a catcher, he had to actually adjust his delivery, shoot his elbow forward, and yank the ball down to get it into the strike zone and change his mechanics. And so we actually had to take a step back, address this particular point in the sequence, and get his elbow up, get his shoulders on plane, on time, and address it from that other side. So another example, the, the player that we just talked about went from 96 to 105 on pull downs. Well, his issue is actually right here. It's from point A to point B, because he's able to replicate these patterns on a full running pull down that gives him all this linear momentum, but now we just shorten that linear momentum to a one step shuffle, and initially he's, he hasn't been able to transfer that pattern. So that's where the current break is for him. He starts going cross body, the pattern breaks down. So that's where the focus is going to be for the time being. From there, he can again move on down, down the line and challenge it incrementally. Interestingly enough, this is the same approach to backwards chaining that we'll use for any anchor. So pull downs are just an anchor drill. 
we look at pull downs as, or pull downs are just a drill rather. We look at pull downs, long toss, walk and wind up, step backs, uh, pivot pickoffs, ten toes. These are all drills. These are all diff different iterations or uh, variations of throwing, of your delivery. And so if you look at it from that lens, let's say pull downs aren't your anchor. Let's say the rocker drill was something that just clicked for you. If the rocker drill is what clicked for you and that's your anchor, you're still taking this approach of incrementally figuring out and reverse engineering, hey, I wanna be able to re repeat this pattern that just clicked off the mount in a game with command. I can do it in a rocker. What are the steps in between that'll get me there? So it's the same approach that we'll take. It just depends on the athlete. It depends on what their anchor is. It depends on what they're working on mechanically. But again, we build out their drill progression specifically based on where they're at, where they're trying to go, and we reverse engineer that process. Tip number two is don't abandon your anchors. Uh, again, we talk about this in the, the anchors video, and so I'm just gonna go through this quickly. But basically, if pull downs are your mechanical anchor, seems super obvious, don't stop doing them. What most people do is that they go through this pull down phase, this pull down program, right? They'll do eight weeks of pull downs, they'll gain 10 miles an hour. Then they never do a pull down again until next off season. Maybe they gain a little bit of velo on the mound, maybe they don't, but they just completely scrap it from their program. The problem with this is that you can think about it as there's two sides to this, this equation. There's the pattern you've created in your anchor, and there's, there's the pattern you're trying to create. You're trying to transfer that and create that pat new pattern that your body's never felt before off the mound. Now, what most people do is they create this, this new feel on pull downs, and then they just completely scrap that side of the equation and start focusing on the second side of the equation. What I'm suggesting is you create that new feel and then you hold it constant. You hold that one side of the equation constant. And what this looks like is you keep pull downs in your program or whatever your anchor is somewhere. It could be as simple as doing two to three pull downs before your bullpens and making sure that they're above a certain threshold. If you got up to 100 on pull downs in your velo phase, hey, do three pull downs before your bullpen and make sure they're all over 96. Move on. You're going to maintain that metric. You're going to maintain that pattern, you're going to maintain that feel as opposed to just completely dropping it off and getting rid of it altogether. So that's really the summary of why anchors are so important. It's something you want to keep in your program. You don't want to just eliminate it altogether. Uh, the other issue is that it's really common to get an initial velocity bump, right? We had a coach who uh, did turn and burns, version of pull downs, and copped on the mound and was immediately plus three or four miles an hour. And he started just working on the mound. He forgot about continuing to do turn and burns and his mound velocity started to drop because he, again, didn't hold that first side of the equation that got him that new pattern. He didn't hold it constantly, he just stopped doing it altogether. Tip number three is mound blending. Now, this is a little bit of a uh, experimental approach. It does work for some guys, it doesn't work for other guys. It's something to try. It's something to take a couple sessions and try if you're struggling with this. Uh, it's less of a methodical approach than what I've already described, it's more of a Again, instead of going from point A to point B to point C, we're going from like point A to point Z, but we're trying to blend them together back to back so that you can give your body an environment to actually feel the transfer. So if you're like, if you're on the cusp and you can almost get it off the mound, but you just can't quite, then that's an athlete who I might try mound blending with. Basically, you're creating an environment that maximizes the chance that something clicks in for the athlete. The goal is that once you create this one-time feel, it gives the athlete something to mentally latch onto. If you've never felt what it's like to get your arm up and on plane or get the shoulders closed off the mound or effectively block the lead leg, if you've never felt any of these things, then you're kind of in this uncharted territory initially as an athlete until you feel it once. Once you felt it once, you're like, aha, I know, what, I know exactly what that feels like. You have something to shoot for. You have something to try to repeat. But until you feel it one time, you have nothing to latch onto. So we're trying to, put, trying to create an environment that gives them this higher likelihood that something will click. And from there, they can latch onto it and branch it out and try to repeat it. So there's two approaches to mound blending. The first is to actually alternate pull downs with mound throws. So you could literally do a pull down and immediately go and throw a pitch off a mound into a net or, in, or to a catcher, go back to pull down, go back to throwing off your, out of your delivery off the mound, and you can alternate these two. And again, you're just trying to start to merge the patterns versus doing you know, t pull downs and then 15 minutes later, you're throwing off the mound. It's not giving your body as immediate of a chance of, of a shot at the basket to try to merge those patterns. So that's one approach. The second approach is to actually do all of your drill work, all of your you know, backwards training progressions, if you're doing pivot pickoffs or 10 toes, or slide steps or walking, whatever you're doing, do all of those off the mound as well, rather than doing those on flat ground. 
So simply switching everything to being off the mound can help transfer, especially if the issue in an athlete specific case is just needing more reps off the mound. Just doing everything off the slope can help blend those patterns a little bit better. So doing your pull downs off the mound, doing your pivot pickoffs off the mound, doing everything off the mound um, can help encourage that transfer as well. Tip number four is to actually identify the specific mechanical breakdown. So again, it doesn't matter how well you try to work incrementally through this process if there's just some egregious mechanical limiting factor that's standing in your way. You might be able to transfer some of that, but if your arm is still way down at landing or you're flying way open or whatever the egregious mechanical issue is, you need to be able to slow down, focus on that first, and then integrate it into the, uh, into the approach. The most, by far and away, the two most common mechanical issues that we see when guys aren't transferring their pull downs, when their pull down is like 15 or 20 miles an hour higher than their mound velocity, the most common two reasons are lack of weight shift and a lack of an efficient linear move. Now we can consider the weight shift the drift, so lack of drift, you can talk about the linear move as the hinge, but it's essentially the leg lift, the initial forward move, and it's the hinge, the linear move on the backside. The reason being that pull downs don't actually work on the first half of the throw. So guys who don't transfer it have problems in the first half of the throw, which is the leg lift, and it's the linear move. There's usually a problem in one of those two areas. You can think about it in a different way, Pull downs help you produce velocity with a ton of linear momentum, but throwing off the mound requires you to produce velocity from a standstill. So you need to be able to figure out how to produce that same amount of uh, those, those lower half positions and that energy from a standstill. So you can actually attack the, attack the issue from a drill or a fields perspective as well. If you specifically notice that an athlete isn't shifting their weight well or doesn't know how to hinge, then maybe you can give them a bunch of fields progressions uh, maybe you can give them different drill progressions to work on the hinge in particular versus just trying to constantly do more and more pull downs and shuffles. You can address it from this other perspective and actually try to figure out the underlying mechanical breakdown that's occurring off the mound. Another way of putting this is that if you don't know how to drift or hinge, then your pull down numbers are really useless. It doesn't matter. It's not going to transfer uh, or it's not going to fully transfer at least if you don't know how to actually shift your weight and repeat your patterns uh, from a standstill drift and hinge. So an example of this in practice, uh, one of our former athletes, Andrew Owen, he was an upper 80s, low 90s guy, graduated college as a senior, unsigned, undrafted. And first time I evaluated him, I saw his patterns were very, very efficient from foot strike through the, through the end of his throw. He had a really good lead leg block, he was close at landing, his arm was on plane, unwound really, really well, great finish to the throw. And I told him, you're, you know, we're gonna do pull downs, but you're probably not gonna need them for very long and you're gonna throw 100 miles an hour the first time you do pull downs. He threw 100 the first time he did pull downs. He threw 102 the second or third week he did pull downs. And from there, we, we really didn't place a ton of emphasis on pull downs at that point um, because his issue after evaluating him wasn't the end of the throw. It was he didn't know how to drift. He didn't have that initial weight shift and he didn't know how to hinge. He didn't know how to actually stay in his backside, stay back as he moved forward, right? He would just kind of come out of the backside and not actually hinge and, and have an efficient linear move that he could rotate out of. He would just kind of fall down the mound and extend. So until we addressed those two issues, he was an upper 80s guy who was pulling down 102 miles an hour. Once we addressed those two issues, a few months later, he was a 94, 96 mile an hour guy and got signed by the Cardinals. Tip number five is to match timing and posture. So as you're trying to figure out kind of what the mechanical breakdown is, again, it's usually the drift with hinge, but as you're trying to figure it out, sometimes it can be something more subtle, uh, like posture or timing or uh, some of these other variables we'll talk about. Let's say you notice in your pull downs, you take a look at your video and you notice in your pull downs, A, your stride is on target. You're, you're landing, your stride is right on target, and maybe you're breaking your hands from about waist height, and you have a slight forward lean with your torso. And then you look at your mountain mechanics, and you're upright, you're striding cross body, and your hands are breaking from chest height. Right. Clearly there's not gonna be a transfer from those two patterns if from the very start of the throw, the hand position where you're starting and your, your torso and pelvic position, your posture is in a different spot. So at least getting the start of the throw right, at least matching the hand position, the torso position, the pelvic position, at least getting some of these things similar um, gives you a better chance of actually transferring and help you identify what is the reason that this isn't transferring. Pull downs are a different pattern, obviously, than throwing off the mound, but they should have very, very similar positions from foot strike to bar release. So if we look at back foot position or angle, that should be very, very similar. 
back knee flexion angle, the amount of knee bend in the back leg should be almost identical. Back knee slash hip position, so are you a vertical shin guy? Are you more of an internal rotation dominant guy? Generally, when what guys feel on pull downs or what they exhibit on pull downs when that's their anchor is the optimal back hip position for them. So you might see a guy who's IR dominant on pull downs, throwing 100, he gets on the mound, his coach told him to throw with a vertical shin and he's throwing 88. And so you might kind of see there's a, mis a mismatch there, identify it that way. Degree of pelvic tilt is his pelvis level on pull downs and tipping way uphill from his very first move from his leg lift off the mound. Trunk posture, we touched on that. Handbrake tempo and starting position. Again, are the hands starting in the same position or not? A handbrake tempo, so the tempo of the arm action, how fast the arm action actually unfolds. What you can do is you can actually go on, on video and count the frames from when the hands break to when you actually release the ball. You might find that it's really quick and efficient on pull downs because you have this athletic movement. 14, 15, 16 frames, and you might find that, find that off the mound, you're stalling over the rubber, and it's this really long, labored, slow tempo arm action that's 20 or 25 frames. Handbrake tempo, lead foot angle, are you landing on target, are you landing closed, are you landing open? Lead leg knee flexion angle, are you landing with a soft front leg, a firm front leg? Arm slot, this is a big one. Just like back hip positioning, Arm slot, whatever arm slot you have on pull downs is often the optimal arm slot for the athlete. So you might find that you're a little bit of a lower or a little bit of a higher arm slot degree of contralateral tilt on pull downs, and you might find that your arm slot off the mound just doesn't mirror that. Again, this goes hand in hand with, with trunk posture because again, those two things are linked. Look at the positions and pay attention to the positions that you create on pull downs and try to see if those things kind of mirror each other at all on the mound or if they're completely separate and try to figure out what are the things that are different. You can almost put these side by side in a list and say here's where they are on flat ground or on pull downs, here's where they are on the mound and identify where the breakdown is occurring. I threw a lot of information at you. Uh, obviously I don't have a magical quick fix in every case. It does depend on the athlete but I'm trying to give you guys some tools that you can actually use. To summarize this, pull downs aren't for everybody but if they are an anchor for you it is worth working on the transfer and it is something that does take time. Point number two, to do this, keep performing pull downs. Don't take them out of your program and incrementally add variables to challenge the pattern, focusing on that specific step when a breakdown does occur. So wherever you begin to see the pattern break down, focus on that step. Don't try to jump further on in the process until you've addressed that, that step where you're struggling. And then finally, keep an eye out for obvious postural and timing differences, as well as limitations in the initial move and hinge, as these are the most common mechanical culprits for the lack of transfer. Finally, you can experiment with mound blending. That's another trick that can work in certain cases if you, if you wanna try that as well. Guys, that's it for this video. If you like the content, go ahead, like it, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to this channel. Our goal is to put out the absolute best content related to pitching development on YouTube. If you guys have any questions related to your specific careers and pitching development, go ahead and shoot us an email to contact at treadathletics.com. Again, we read and respond to every single email. And finally, if you guys want daily content, you can follow us on Instagram at tread underscore athletics or on Twitter at tread athletics. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you guys soon. And like this video, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel. Our, uh, You're literally going to have that on video of a fly flying in my eye.